right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos, and I am joined by somebody you all know, the great Jay Dyer. How are you doing, sir? Doing great. You don't have to man, you have been though. hitting the rounds. Mm -hmm. It's been great to see you freaking blow up, man. You've been on Tim Cass. You've been on uh, Elijah Schaefer. You've been doing the like ma major, major streams. You did all day stream Saturday. I saw the check, uh, the one with you and Jamie on Alex, Je oh, Lord Voldemort. But uh, uh, dude, you've been blowing up, man. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of really big interviews and the biggest of all hasn't even come out yet we had a, we filmed a whole special uh i can't say what it is yet but uh that'll be out in april so when we were in texas kind of doing a whole media junket type of thing down there <clears throat> um the, the biggest is yet to come out so that's going to be um it's going to be funny i'll put it this way uh i wear a bald cap and i'm dressed up like an inter international villain that we all may know <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward to that one um well dude it yeah it, it, it has been great to see you uh basically get somewhat half of a foot in into the mainstream man and like uh, everybody's kind of been asking buying for your attention so i appreciate you coming over to my lowly little channel but um i was wanting to get into ecumenicism um this is a growing topic of importance i titled tonight's stream Ec uh, ecumenism and the death of truth because really this uh, epistemologically is going to come down to relativism and this total dissolution of boundaries which whether we get into philosophy or the postmodern turn or uh the de degeneracy in our culture it all kind of deals with this dissolution of objective boundaries um and so i want to dive into the ecumenism and the problems with this and you know to start with where where do you see this problem sort of emerging? Ecumenicism is obviously historically associated with Christianity, um, but you could point towards the Renaissance with the Prisca Theologia and the perennialism and stuff like that. But maybe just to open up for people, what is ecumenism and how does this develop into, because I assume we're eventually going to get into some of the major foundations that funded this stuff. How does it lead up to that point? Yeah, great question. So the origins are not anything nefarious, right? The, the term itself, uh, oikumene, is where we get the same terminology for ecumenical councils, right? So a lot of people might be confused thinking that the modern ecumenist movement is synonymous with the ecumenical councils, and that is not the case. So there's a big difference between <clears throat> the attitude of the church, say, in the first thousand years when there's an ecumenical council called with the purpose of reconciling everybody, which is done with the presupposition that somebody's going to come back to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong, right? For example, in the Council of Nicaea, we don't just try to find a middle position between Arianism and the deity of Christ, right? It's not this project of just always trying to find the happy medium. Right. It's a question of uh, the ecumenism of return, as it's eventually called. Uh, mm. in the modern era and that's the ecumenism that gets rejected so if we understand that um the origins of it come out of as we said the the, the notion of the oikumene the universal church nothing wrong with that nothing malicious nothing in uh pro problematic about that but where we start to see this verging into something else is i think you're right to point to uh actually papalism so the the origins of the ecumenist movement where we subordinate um the theological truths to geopolitical truths, uh, papalism, you know, as the, you know, unifying factor in all of Christianity, something like that, which I would say is, is largely a kind of a geopolitical right. uh, focus. So that that's where we start to see it. And it starts to emerge, as you know, uh, we get a revolution of the church in the 11th century to the, during the Gregorian reforms mm -hmm. where uh, papalism takes on a new level far beyond what anybody had seen before. And even Eastern Catholic theologians admit that the Roman Catholic Eastern Uniates admit that the 11th century is where we really start to see the Gregorian revolution. And so that revolution of the church paves the way for the Western Latin church to engage in quite a few revolutions. One of which is that Renaissance period that you're talking about, which I know you know about, because you talked about it when I did an event 
Mm -hmm. you know, that, that period where we have a lot of <clears throat> Neoplatonic magic coming to the fore, especially people like Agrippa and uh, people right. like Randala, these figures, right? Right. They have a, a new approach to what you call, right, the Prisca Theological, which is a, a form of perennialism where now all of the religions are kind of just instantiations of a higher, you know, supra religion. Right. And the goal of the particular religions is ultimately to maybe conform to or eventually converge in some kind of universal religion. And some of those Renaissance figures did write about the possibility of some, you know, future new religion. Uh, I've been reading through um, the book that, that came out from Cambridge about the uh, Byzantine figure of Plethon, who was mm -hmm. to modern humanism. And Plethon was a, a platonic uh, pagan. Wasn't yeah, he? he was a platonic pagan who said, who wanted to revive the platonic uh, tradition in, Byz in Byzantium, which had been shut down. So right. from the time of Justin uh, St. Justinian up until the later stages of Byzantium, you had an attempt to persecute and the pushing of uh, Neoplatonism in all of its forms kind of underground. And then you see a resurgence once Byzantium falls. And uh, that tradition of the Prisca Theologica of the uh, uh, of what will what will become modern ecumenism continues on in various secret societies and various groups. So I'm not trying to equate all ecumenism with a secret society, but I'm saying there are ideological predecessors, which you've hinted at, that are definitely right. there. So long story short, coming up to the modern era, um, even the Roman Catholic Church, ironically, with uh, various papal encyclicals, was very anti-ecumenist all the way up until the last anti-ecumenist statement by Pius XI in his famous encyclical Mortalium Animos in 1928. So mm -hmm. even the papacy, which which we might think at different times in history has had this bent towards a, a, a false ecumenism, a false union. For example, the council of Florence is a mm -hmm. false union. Um, right. When we get to the modern period, the Roman church is totally opposed to it because they saw it ironically as a uh, Protestant movement. And mm. it's Protestant because we could probably trace what we know of today as the ecumenist movement to the Anglican branch theory. And the mm -hmm. Anglican branch theory is, is an older Anglican theory to ecclesiology, which says, well, we're not full on Calvinist Protestants or, you know, uh, Congregationalists. We do believe there should be a hierarchy. We should have a concern for the seven ecumenical councils, uh, this kind of a thing. I'm saying the more high church Anglican, right? The, right. The traditional Anglican view. But they said, we don't want to go with the Roman Catholic view of the church and we don't want an Orthodox view. We got to have, we had to have a new theory. And so the Anglicans developed what they call branch theory, which is the idea that the church exists amongst these various branches. There's the Protestant branch, Anglican branch is the best, I guess, of the Protestants. There's the Orthodox mm -hmm. branch and there's the Roman Catholic branch. And then I guess the, the Oriental Orthodox that all branches out into different churches, which are still in some way part of the one universal Catholic church. Um, that is, of course, obviously not the Orthodox view. We have to right. reject branch theory. And traditional Roman Catholicism also is supposed to reject branch theory as well. But there's a change after uh, the Mortalium Animos of 1928. And there's also a change, not everywhere in Orthodoxy, but um, there begins to be uh, Anglican Orthodox dialogues amongst the Greeks, I think in the 1890s. Um, I read several books on this many years ago. And then there were some meetings between Anglicans and Orthodox and a few other places. And I wouldn't even call those necessary malicious because it really depends on what the purpose or the attitude of the meetings is. There's nothing wrong with academic conferences. There's nothing wrong with people right. getting together, discussing their ideas. The problem, I think, comes when we get into the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, where ecumenism really begins to be co-opted and part of a geopolitical movement by very wealthy and powerful people to, by their own admission, steer uh, Christianity into a direction that they want to go in. Right. So it's not really until we, and then we, that's when we start to see these entities like the National Council of Churches, the World Council of Churches, which really become yep. the focus of ecumenical activities, as well as other entities too. Um, and they're connected to the United Nations and these kinds of things. Uh, and again, initially, the even the Roman Catholic Church, all the way up until 1920s, uh, totally condemns this. It says it's a heterodox. Many Orthodox clergy, especially at that time, still condemned it. But you have this gradual warming up. And I'll, I'll end with this part, which is just that the main error is an ecclesiological error. 
And it's an ecclesiological error because it's a, it's an Nestorian type of Christology, which if we think about Nestorianism and Christology, you have <clears throat> the two natures of Christ in the hypostatic union, right? We have right. a single divine person with a human nature. The divine person possesses a divine nature and a human nature, but he's not a human person. And so that perfect uh, hypostatic union means that the mode in which God's presence in the incarnate Christ is there is different than the mode of his presence everywhere else. Right. So it doesn't mean that he's not omnipresent, right? Would we, when we think about Christ walking around in Jerusalem, right? Is it still true that Christ is omnipresent? Is he in China? Sure. Cause he's omnipresent, but what makes it his presence unique when he's walking around incarnate over there in Jerusalem? Well, what makes him unique is that the mode of his presence is as the incarnate son, mm. there's a unique presence of him over there and the same right. we get that with the theophanies and with you know the the presence of uh the angel of the lord in the old testament these theophanies show that while god is omnipresent there's also a unique sense in which he can be present at a specific place in a specific time right and that christological basis is what uh informs our ecclesiology so we can't have an ecclesiology divorced from christology because the church right. is the body of christ therefore right. Whatever is true of Christology in terms of Christ being a theanthropic being, the God man, right. must also be the case for the mystical body of the church. And the mystical body of the church is not split, divided, or amongst thousands of different sects. So that's why we have to understand that uh, modern ecumenism is an ecclesiological heresy because it, it does what Nestorian does, it does for the church, what Nestorianism does for Christology, which is that it says, that the divine presence is actually divided from the visible bodily presence. There's right. a split and there's a division there because, yeah, Christ might be in some special way in the Orthodox Church, but he's also present everywhere. And the argument is always, well, don't you think the Holy Spirit is everywhere present? Yeah, but that's not the argument. The argument is not about his omnipresence. The argument is about his unique presence in his mystical body, which is the right. church. And it cannot be a thousand. Paul says there's one holy Catholic apostolic church, right? Right. One body, it's well, the creed says that following what's in Ephesians and other texts. Right. But, and one last thing I'll say is that that does not mean, as everybody sort of assumes, that I'm saying that, oh, I'm damning everyone else. I don't know people's individual destinies. We're not told that. God, I think, in his wisdom, doesn't give us because how bad are we at judging these kinds of people? <laughs> right. Know. I don't know people's uh, ultimate destinies. And I think many church fathers, if you look at the tradition of, um, you know, baptism of desire, baptism of blood, the church has always counted them amongst the saints. And so that means that people can be united to the church in uh, unique ways that are known only to God, such as the thief on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's entirely possible that, that Christ can unite people to him that have not gone through the normative means of baptism and reception of the church, right? So, right. so Christ can make up for what the church fails to do. Right. But we don't compromise the doctrine of the body because of that, we have to have both of these things in tandem. And in at the last hymn, there's actually a section where St. Maximus talks about this is really good. I think it's, I'm going from memory here, but it might be 13 or, or mm -hmm. 23, somewhere in there. Uh, it's the response to the, at the, it's, to, it's, it's at the last hymn on the Holy Spirit and his presence in the world. Because the ecumenists will always argue that, well, the Holy Spirit's present everywhere. But that's not the argument. The argument is not, is he omnipresent? The argument is, is the redemptive divinization work of the holy spirit present everywhere or is it only present in the mystical body and saint mm. maximus argues that the mode of the holy spirit's present it's present in the mystical body is unique and not the same as the mode of his presence everywhere in nature so while it's true that there's grace outside the church that leads people and pulls people to christ no one can be saved without being united to that one mystical body of christ right and are there thief on the cross people sure i, I have no doubt that in his own way, God can do that. But that doesn't mean that ecumenism is true. It doesn't mean that uh, all religions are, are essentially on a gradated, great gradation of scale uh, of being right to the, to the one true church. And that's the Vatican II model. The Vatican mm, II model has the Roman right. church in the center, Eastern Orthodox, Protestants or Anglicans. And then it's sort of like, and, and there's this scale of gradation, right? And that's not the case. So while it's true that there is grace outside the church, and that's the only way that we could ever come to the church, it doesn't follow from that, that the mystical body exists outside the body. That doesn't make any sense because the Orthodox Church is the mystical body of Christ. Right. And I want to hammer that point because it was something I wanted to bring up uh, as well is that 
I've noticed even within the Orthodox circles, and I've talked with some people who follow your work, follow my channel, and they're in the Oriental Church. And there is a real emphasis trying to, in a way, obfuscate or blur that distinction. And it all comes down to Christology often, which, like you said, is a, is a total reflection then of our ecclesiology. Right. And so I was, before we even get into then the, the, the globalist funding and pushing of uh, ecumenism, why is it that we as Eastern Orthodox Christians have to maintain these fundamental distinctions when it comes to Christology, whether you're a monophysite, a meophysite, or a Nestorian, um, that it, yes, we share a lot of history, yes, we share a lot of uh, doctrines and, and perspectives, but this is coming down to the fundamental crux of, again, today's stream is as Orthodox apologists, we have to make sure that we are defending the true faith and the true church and the true Christology and ecclesiology and all this stuff. So why is it that people who may think, you know what, I'm I'm pretty sympathetic to all that Eastern Orthodoxy stuff. I love that energy essence distinction and their Christology and how they do their apologetics. But, you know, I'll, I'll commune over here in this church. That doesn't make you Orthodox in our in an Eastern Orthodox sense. You may be Oriental Orthodox or Assyrian or whatever, but that's not the same thing. Can you explain why it is so important that you kind of already hit it, but why we have to maintain these distinctions and separate Oriental or Catholic, you know, Protestantism we all get, but Catholic and Oriental, they cannot be blended into Eastern Orthodoxy. Yeah, so let's, uh, that's a great question, and, and I want to be you know as clear as I can so people don't misunderstand me or take my words out of context or whatever. Uh, so let's be really nuanced and, and try to be as clear as possible, uh, my understanding of this. And, and I, what I would say is that the, uh, <clears throat> on, in, on, from one vantage point, it's in or out, right? There's no half orthodox. There's no uh 30 orthodox 75 percent orthodox right you're either in right. the mystical body or you're not right that's different from whether people who you know die in in say oriental orthodoxy but didn't know anything about all the controversies and they never consciously believed in some heresy and be or thought that they were orthodox right or something mm -hmm. like that you know if christ in his grace mystically unites them he can do that god right. we can't say god doesn't do that we don't know that but that's between them and God. That doesn't mean that I compromise all my ecclesiology or anything like that. I, I, we still have to maintain and, and operate like the apostles do in the book of Acts, which is that when Paul, for example, goes out in the book of Acts, there's two chapters. I think it's like eight and then like 19 or 18 or 19. You know, he finds people that are uh, uh, disciples of John the Baptist or uh, of Apollos, uh, right, who have not been fully instructed. And they're kind of meeting together and doing their own thing. And the, the, the notes in the Orthodox Study Bible are great because they uh, they make this point to stress that in those examples, Paul does the work of trying to bring them under the episcopate. Mm. So he doesn't just say, oh, yeah, it's cool. Uh, you know, do whatever you want. We're all non-denominational. Set up your rock band on uh, strip mall church, right? Because everything's cool. No, he says, that's <laughs> great. And he treats them like they're brothers because they haven't done anything that would initially make them not brothers. And so he treats them as potentially in the church, potential brothers and tries to bring them under the Episcopate. And right. I think that that's fine. We can do that. Right. You know, that, that section where Jesus, uh, everybody always says, well, ecumenism is proven by the fact that, you know, they're casting out demons and Jesus says, let them alone. He doesn't just say, let them alone. He says, there's nobody who can uh, cast out a demon in my name who will not also soon be amongst us. Mm -hmm. So they always leave out that part as right. if, Jesus is just like, yeah, man, do whatever you want, dude. Everybody's doing their own thing, dude. It doesn't yeah, really that, work like that. That's right? like the Jesus would love the the sex workers and all the transgenders. And if he was here, he would probably be with all the homosexuals. Well, he would tell them to stop doing what they're doing and then follow him. There's a difference there. Yes, both things are true. Right? So, yeah, he was hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners, but he was also telling them to, you know, come to church. Right? So, or, <laughs> right. to, you know, he's setting up the church. You know what I mean? Follow me. Yeah. So exactly. Like there's two parts to that. And a lot of people like to leave out the other part. Um, yeah. So the 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 situation with ecumenism, then, I think, is that the, the body, my understanding is the mystical body of the church is the Orthodox Church. That's the presuppositions of the church right the only the orthodox church has the healing of the news has this the sacramental graces and power that are necessary to accomplish 
what is lacking in those other churches. Right. And so while it's true that we might be able to accept the, uh, the ritual that went on in another church, right? We can, we can, through economy, there can be the acceptance of this or that ritual that was done in a certain way. We don't make a judgment that they were necessarily therefore received into the mystical body. We don't know that. Uh, right. And I would say that the, the presupposition of the church is that the grace of the reception into our church, whether it's by chrismation, baptism, or profession makes up for what was lacking in those situations. Right. So, you know, the spirit of the law, I think, is that God is not a miser. And if he can <laughs> save the thief on the cross, and if he can, uh, you know, save uh, the people or bring them under the episcopacy in the book of Acts who are not fully instructed in, in the theology, we're not trying to make uh, a PhD in theology the, the prerequis prerequisite for salvation. Right. So we don't make the judgment calls in individuals' cases. However, we do make, um, and I think this is this is a later sort of canon law concept uh, that comes about later on the, in the Middle Ages, but there's this idea that there's the uh, what we call the public profession. And so canon law, these kinds of things, because we don't know people's intentions, uh, the, the law, the canon is not always trying to judge what can never really be known. It's trying to judge what's, what's in the public sphere. And so what's in the public sphere, we can know. And that's when we have, for example, a public group that has a heterodox confession, for example, the Baptist right. church, right. right? The Baptist church has a public confession that is heterodox. And we say that that is a heterodox confession. Does it mean that I, as an individual, then say, ha ha, I get to say everybody in the Baptist church is going to hell and I get to like, you know, <laughs> use Nietzsche and Resentiment and feel like I'm better than everybody. That, that's not the right attitude, right? If right. I know that that's a heterodox confession, then my attitude is I want those people to be healed and I want them to come to the right faith. Right. And so God doesn't tell us individuals destinies but he, what he does tell us is that it's our duty to tell them to become orthodox right and that's always this has always been my approach to this and i think that that's the that's the balanced position and i'm always open to being corrected i don't i don't if i'm wrong about this it's okay i'm if somebody has a better argument they can present that i don't care right but that's my understanding and, and that's that's how i would say that on the one hand people can be united to the church in uh abnormal or uh extenuating circumstances via the thief on the cross, but they're still being united to the body of Christ. They're not right. being saved outside the church. There is no right. salvation outside the church. They're being united to the church in a non-normative way, but we don't leap from that to say, Oh, well then, then everybody's saved. Because <laughs> right. Let's let's one last thing. Let's take, yeah, the, no, go ahead. Let's take the issue of heresy or schism. In the church fathers, heresy and schism are specific sins. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're not a heretic because you're just in some group, right? You're a heretic because with knowledge and obstinacy, right, you reject what is true, what, is, what has been presented right. to you. And so do we know in the case of people who have not been presented the truth if they're necessarily a heretic? Well, later on, the church develops in different theologians and different uh, manuals and philosophers and so forth, the, the distinction between material and formal heresy. And I would say that even though it's used more commonly in the Latin church, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that distinction because it's like, uh, you know, the Baptist grandma, like she doesn't know anything about theology. Uh, is she maliciously uh, going around trying to be heretic? Not necessarily. So does that mean she's saved? I'm not told that. Right. I, I'm not told that. So I think the, the, the brilliance here of the Orthodox position, as I understand it, is just that it's not my duty to, to sit around and try to figure out. Paul says, who are we to judge those that are without God judges those. Right. Our concern is with those who are within and our duty right. is to tell those people to come in. What God does with them is up to God. I don't have to sit. And that's a much easier because I don't have to sit around worrying about, you know, uh, damning Bapt Baptist grannies all day or something like that. <laughs> right. Not and my, it doesn't mean to do that. And it doesn't mean that we can't have uh, friends, associates of different, you know, yeah, different walks of Christianity. Point. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying that you as an Orthodox Christian, you can't be friends with people of different Christian persuasions. 
But that's why I titled it The Death of Truth, because you keep referring back to the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the salvific Christ is the truth, capital T. Truth is a who, not a what. And so therefore, maintaining these theological nuances and distinctions is essential because we're claiming we're led by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, is leading us towards the truth. We cannot then water down the doctrines or, or sort of blur these distinctions so that it's more uh, accommodating to other people. So right. we can there's two, both can be true. We can be friends with people and we can be very cordial. And in fact, you can interview other you know, Christian apologists or philosophers. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Right. However, equating then the faiths and equating the traditions and saying that we're all practicing the same form of Christianity, that is not the, the case. And by assuming that, We'll eventually get into it. It's now promoting a sense of relativism, which is now putting people entirely outside this salvific body of Christ, because this notion is keeping people away from the truth. Yeah, exactly. Another important thing to mention here is the notion of communion. And in the Orthodox view, communion is only celebrated uh, by the confession of the Scythios in churches where the Orthodox bishop has given permission to the Orthodox priest to celebrate the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the symbol and sign of our communal unity. So mm -hmm. it cannot exist, according to the logic of the Confession of the Scythios, outside of the Orthodox faith. So while Roman Catholics might have a uh, service and they might revere their wafers and all that, we as Orthodox <laughs> would not say that that is, I'm serious, we, we would not say that that is the body, blood, soul, and uncreated right. energy of Christ. Right. Now, again, does that mean that I'm damning all the Roman Catholics? I'm not told the, the destiny of Roman Catholics. What I am told, though, is that outside of the Orthodox Church, there is not the medicine of healing. Right. And so I want those people to have the medicine, and that's why I want them to come into the Orthodox Church. I don't want them to just be in any kind of church because defective theology typically leads to defective living and defective liturgical celebration. And that's why you see in the Roman Catholic Church it's not the fault of the people. It's not the fault of the laity. It was a top-down decision to renovate and revolutionize that church many, many times over many centuries. And what you get now in a lot of those Novus Ordo churches, the clown masses, the, the hip-hop masses, the, you know, <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm not being mean, I'm being serious. No, they are, you're they, literally they describing serve, what they're doing. They don't serve to heal and give the, the medicine. They don't have the noetic power to heal the news, which is what we need. And right. that's why, uh, you know, Father Hears does have a great point about the notion of the presuppositions of the faith. It's not just an intellectual thing, right? You also need the medicine that the sacraments of the Orthodox Church has. And the sacramentology in the Roman Catholic Church is getting so wild that it's all over the place. Right. So even some Orthodox people will take issue with this attitude. And it's not because I have a desire to hate Roman Catholics or even hate the institution per se. I think it's a, it's a dangerous institution. I think it leads people into a lot of delusions and it, it wrecks a lot of people's faith because it's, it's so corrupt. Yep. And that doesn't mean that there's not corruption in the Orthodox church. It just means that that's a different structure, right? That's a right. top down structure. And if the top goes bad, the structure goes bad. Right. Right. Again, doesn't even mean the people are bad people. Right. I know a lot of Roman Catholics that I'm friends with that I think are, that I think are cool. Amazingly, still after all these years, we still have Roman Catholic friends, um, and we disagree, and we can have civil, you know, disagreements and still remain friends. I don't hate them, but I think a lot of people take, uh, for example, you know, a lot of the 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 aggressive stuff on Twitter or on YouTube uh, debates or whatever against Roman Catholics as if it's a hatred of those people as a class. It's not. It's it's a disagreement with and a concern over a corrupt institution that. Uh, for example, let me give you one, one example. There was a guy, I won't name him, but just a, a prominent figure that I've, I've never personally interacted with him. I did reach out to him and try to, um, you know, get him into orthodoxy. And he was a very prominent writer for a big uh, Catholic uh, publication for online publication for many years. And he just kind of gradually was moving, you know, away from, from religion and, and as, a, as a whole, becoming more and more of an atheist because of these problems in the papacy. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the same because I had the same kind of course in my 20s when I was a traditional Catholic and I, and I was just getting more and more fed up. And I saw the same thing. And I reached out and I said, look, you know, why don't you uh, come chat with us? You know, come check out Orthodox Church, something like that. And he was just like, "Nah, I'm just I'm done. I'm done with religion as a whole because I don't see any other churches being any any different than what's in the Roman Catholic Church. Right. And in my experience, 
of course, there's going to be problems. Every church has problems, but I do think the Orthodox Church is different. It's a unique experience. It is not the same as my experience in the Roman Catholic Church at all. And if the Roman Catholic Church is getting to the point where this, just look at the celebration of the sacraments. There's priests in the Roman Catholic Church that are saying, in the baptisms, you are baptized in the name of the land, the sea, and the air. That's not a baptism. What? Yeah. There's <laughs> even, been case, even, there's even been cases where they baptize in the name of the mother, like the goddess or the earth. What? Yeah. And so on nobody's standards are those actual baptisms because they're not even it's not even a ritual even close to the traditional ritual of the church. And it's not even Trinitarian. Right. Right. So if that's what's going on in the Roman Catholic world, and I'm not saying that's everyone in the world, I'm just saying those are cases in the Roman Catholic world. And it's even crazier in the Protestant world too. It's like kind of, it's getting crazy. Yeah. The logic of certain priests that it's more practical then and wise to have one way of receiving converts, which is the row core position is a position of wisdom just because of how crazy it's getting. But I don't think that, and it's not my view that, Oh, oh if you, if you were uh, received by chrismation, you're lost. And I've never said that it's just really weird. And you know, people on the internet have been saying in the last week that that's my view. I never, never said anything like that. Never said, I, I've always said that the church is a grace economy and makes up for whatever's lacking. The economy of- but I think that the position of row core, uh, is, is, is a wise position just because of what I said that, right. You know, if you're receiving people who, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, I was baptized as a, a Roman Catholic, uh, 10 years ago in a crazy Nova Sordo parish. I don't remember how they did it. Well, <laughs> what if they did it in the name of the land scene there and it wasn't a real baptism at all. Right. I mean, what right. do you want baptism? That's the point. Right. Right. So there is no yeah. rebaptism. There's yeah. And you're baptism. hitting on the Roman Catholicism thing. I mean, just within the last couple of years, we've seen Pachamama, which is a human sacrificial goddess of the yes. Amazon. Uh, and more recently, which I know that you're clearly aware of, is the Abrahamic House of Faith. Right. And so I just saw, uh, I, I just popping in, I saw uh, Jordan Peterson just did an interview with like Majid Nawaz. And the whole thing was criticizing uh, Netanyahu and the the sort of Abrahamic Accord. And so they're going forth. And I'm not really interested, but I just clicked it earlier today just to pass the time. And I hear Majid's big upset because they talk about uh, Western civilization as Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Christian, which is already a sort of misnomer. But how well this is this is keeping the 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 is the Islamic faith outside of it. And you guys are basically severing an, a limb of our Abrahamic faith and our Abrahamic family. And so there is this real push right now to equate. Well, and even Jordan Peterson. Oh, you guys share this. We all share the same book, which is really just the Old Testament. And we get, we're all uh, monotheisms, monotheisms. And we might be monotheisms, but we don't worship the same God. They don't worship a Trinitarian God. And so this we already see this cultural popular rhetoric of trying to equate now the abrahamic faiths we're seeing it uh through the institutions and of course pope francis is sort of the the head working uh face of this on the on the christian side and he's trying to speak for all of christians even orthodox even protestants and um and so i, I didn't know if you have any comments about how the, Abra- the abrahamic house of faith how this fits into all this stuff and then we can backtrack back into the funding. And so we're seeing the end point of something that's been pushed for well over a hundred years. Right. So the, the way we get up to this point of uh, subversion is a situation where the subversion was intentionally designed by very wealthy, powerful people who saw that this new idea of what the church could be, that it could be more like an NGO, right? They saw the uh, opportunity to steer this in the direction of, um, geopolitical motivations and geopolitical situations. And for example, in the Rockefeller's uh, authorized biography, they have a whole chapter Mm. about the ecumenist movement, right? And you would think, well, why would these wealthy people care about, I mean, the most wealthy people in the U S right? why would they care about the ecumenist movement? And the answer is that um, they saw it as a way to, to bring in Roman Catholicism, Orthodoxy, and Protestantism under this new ages of the World Council Churches, National Council Churches that they had set up along with the United Nations UNESCO group. And in tandem with all those together, uh, they felt like this could be a new religion, right? A new approach to Christianity where instead of there being any objective truth or any specific one church, 
the approach here would be more of a uh, journey or a praxis to discovering the church. So mm -hmm. the church is in discovery. And they took the high priestly prayer of Christ, right, that we be united as if the, the church isn't united. So it's like, <laughs> right, yeah, oh, that's Christ right. pray for us to be one. Yeah. So that means that we were never one. But in the near distant future, we can all have this new future amorphous unity around the idea that there is no truth. There is a uh, gradual convergence. Right. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? And, 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 they, and they openly talked about that in that chapter. Like they say that, yeah, we'll, we'll use the ecumenist movement essentially to control and steer the church. And then the, the David Wimhoff book, which is that, like that 900 page text, but David Wimhoff book, it goes into a lot of detail explaining the, uh, how this was done specifically in the Roman Catholic church. He's, he's a traditional Catholic talking about the figure of John Courtney Murray, uh, and other, other Jesuits who were approached by uh, CD Jackson and people from the CIA in terms of what they call the, the doctrinal warfare program under the guise of the cold war. So oh, mm. we got to fight the Soviets. We got to fight the, uh, you know, the atheists, uh, Soviet empire. So you need to make an alliance with us and join the fight of Americanism. And while we can understand in the, during the Cold War setting why they would have fallen for that, I'm not trying to fault those people because they, they may have had good motives. The problem is that that comes at a heavy price, right? So the heavy price is that uh, you now have to submit to new masters, right? Right. And we see, we see that going on today where the churches are now really expected to go along with the State Department and the, you know, what, what Uncle Sam says, right? Right. Uh, and that's because it's, it's, it is the same movement going back to, you know, the founding of the, of the ecumenist movement. Um, and you can read about, uh, I think his name was Swam Swami Vivekananda. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. He went and met with, uh, Rockefeller senior and, and Rockefeller senior says, you know what, this guy's, you know, all approaching, all encompassing synchronous approach would be a great, uh, tool for you know steering religion in a certain direction oh, so they even talked about that and so that's the, the 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 turning of ecumenism as a situation where it's like we're going to meet together and hash out disagreements turns into nobody's right we're all wrong we're all in the process towards achieving church church right. is this teleological end times thing and not a historical reality. So it's all premised on the, the rejection of a historical church. Right. And, and so maybe you can dive, continue to follow that line of thought, because I can imagine some people that are less, um, well, knowledgeable about all this stuff. Well, you know, it, it's not a bad idea of trying to get us together and sort of uh, have a unified identity as Christians. And I've seen recently that they're the whole idea that I've seen this rhetoric is like, well, if Islam, Christianity and Judaism unite, then they'll be able to fight the degenerate progressivism or the de degenerate leftism. But again, this is, comes back to a sort of relativism that underpins it. And, and it's just going to lead to everybody being ultimately on the same team. But can you speak to the perniciousness and the deliberate attempt to subvert Christianity through this? ecumenicism and, and it wasn't some oh well maybe we're just going to get together or maybe syncretism is is a is a higher spiritual idea no this was a pernicious attempt from the get-go to subvert it to undermine traditional foundations to lead towards a sort of secular domination of religion itself right so <clears throat> the motivations are not that you know, these powerful families or these people in these NGOs are themselves religious. Now, there may be some of them not, that are, but it's more of a uh, very malicious sort of uh, power philosophy because everything in geopolitics operates on the basis of power moves and power plays. And so they see religion uh, as really a tool or, or an attache of the state. Um, and we, we can find that pretty consistently in church history it's not it shouldn't be anything new because if we, if we think back to the Arian crisis in the fourth century in the Arian crisis uh you had a situation where the emperors in some cases were Arian and they wanted to promote Arianism because it would actually uh promote their state co-opting of the church right um in the same case of the iconoclast crisis you had certain emperors that were uh, iconoclast emperors and it was a, a way for them to use the church as an arm of their power. Likewise, in the West, we have what's called the investiture controversy. And that's a similar situation where a lot of kings had this tendency to appoint the bishops of various important dioceses because they would just make the church an arm of the state. 
So this has always been a problem in the church. And by the way, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, which is supposed to be exempt from this, is not exempt from this by having the pope, because in many cases, the pope has also been a creature of various states and various kings. Uh, you know, the, the Michael Welton book, for example, covers that very well. We also see in the case of uh, the Frankish papacy, uh, when uh, after Charlemagne, we begin to see uh, uh, the, the papacy adopt, not in the days of Charlemagne, but after the days of Charlemagne, we see the papacy adopting the filioque clause as a geopolitical strategy for, so that Charlemagne can say, oh, you see, the, the real churches are the ones that are in union with me that have the filioque in the creed. Right. Right. And that's an actual, you can read about even at the time, uh, St. Photius in his letters talks about how mm. uh, the Franks had a geopolitical motive in doing that. Wow. Because it, it would yeah. be part and parcel with jurisdictions Makes total sense. that the Franks controlled, you see. Makes total sense. So that's why it was important to, to Charlemagne to have the filioque uh, clause in the creed in those uh, areas where he expanded. So, um, and for St. Photius in his letters com complains that the, uh, Carolinian missionaries were encroaching on Bulgarian Orthodox territories where they didn't have the creed. So they were moving into jurisdictions that were Orthodox, right? Right. <clears throat> so um, those are examples in the history of church where we see that, yeah, I mean, this has kind of been a long time struggle, right? And everybody's probably familiar with the story of the, the you know, the Russian church and the KGB bishops, right? We, right. We've all heard of this surely from the yep. Cold War. Um, I just covered a couple texts from, uh, uh, a, a neocon actually, you know, going really deep into um, the history of the uh, the KGB's uh, espionage activities in terms of the Vatican, right? Mm. And, um, you know, how none of that was really, uh, it doesn't come to, as a surprise, right? We all kind of, oh yeah, of course they were, you know, putting spies in the Vatican. Of course there were KGB bishops, not just in the Russian church, but also in the Vatican. Uh, in Poland, for example, the KGB had recruited uh, different bishops during the Cold War. So, so again, th these are not really things that should surprise us because right. it's, it's all throughout church history if we know our church history. And it's unfortunate, but it's no different in our day that the church uh, is under a new kind of assault, which is not uh, an, an and well, I guess in some places it's an over, you know, physical assault from the state. You know, people can get uh, martyred or beat up or whatever. You know, we have the history of the, of the uh, Muslim persecutions of the church, this kind of stuff. But in, in our day, it's just more of an ideological subversion through the heresy of ecumenism, which is just postulating that there's not uh, a single visible historical church, uh, but they were all in the process. And the state power, I'm saying, has seen, and not just the state, but also the money power behind the state, uh, these, these very wealthy pa uh, families and oligarchs and so forth, they have seen it as an opportunity to co-op the church and turn it into a, an Americanist NGO institution. Right. Well, so that's the motivations for them. And it's very well documented. It's surprising to me that a lot of people, I think a lot of people don't study geopolitics. They don't, they don't know about this. They might be studying theology, but they don't know this other domain. But in this other domain, there's quite a few uh, Catholic writers that, that you know, have uh, done a, a great service, I think, in putting out so many excellent scholarly documented i'm not talking about fringe conspiracy theories. i'm talking about intelligence analysts i'm talking about people who are uh you know fbi consultants i'm talking about uh, lawyers like david wimhoff right i mean these, right. these are famous in the sense of academically famous and established uh lecturers and professors and lawyers who are putting out these treatises saying hey wait a minute what about this geopolitical angle at, at vatican ii that had a big influence on you know pushing americanism in the roman catholic church and so forth and you know, I found that to be a, a big piece of the puzzle that I wasn't aware of when I was a 20 year old, you know, Roman Catholic guy, 21 or whatever, just converted to Roman Catholicism. And I was hardcore trad and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> and I realized, well, it's not all about theology. There's also these other power plays and these, you know, uh, state actors. And for people that think that's a conspiracy theory, do you do you not know about the Cold War? I mean, don't you think that the, <laughs> the, the Soviet state installed uh, a whole bunch of bishops. And and for those that don't know, I did a whole uh, lecture with Bishop Jonah, Metropolitan Jonah. I think last year we did a whole interview um, because he knows a lot about the history of the Russian church. And we went really deep into uh, the nuances of the Cold War because a lot of people who don't know about this, they have a tendency to get really either or. Like, oh, everybody mm -hmm. in the Russian church was a, a KGB. That, that is not, it's not like that. In fact, what the KGB did was in the Russian church, they actually had a, a scale uh, a gradation scale of like, these are the bishops that are completely compromised and ones that we installed. 
Mm. These are the bishops that are maybe on our side and maybe compromisable, but maybe not. These are the ones that are not compromisable and are our enemies. And so they had like a scale among right. the, the jurisdictions of the, of the Russian church. And so this idea of like collective guilt of everybody in the Russian church was KGB. A lot of trads have this attitude. Roman Catholics are like, right. oh, KGB. And the, even to this day, trad Roman Catholics are like, you know, the KGB hasn't been around in 30 years. And, you know, traditional Catholics are like, J-Dash, KGB, you know, this kind of <laughs> silly stuff. It's like, there is no KGB. I've never been right. to Russia, right? I, I, I don't have any connection to Putin or any of these people other than one interview one time with an intellectual from Russia. That's it. That's that's the, but I do have a love and interest in history. And right. so, um, and history is very clear about, you know, the reality of power players wanting to use religion. So right. it should be, you know, kind of common sense. One of the things I've noticed in conversations with Orthodox and non-Orthodox Christians is I think the, uh, a key element in where people are going to fall on the ecumenism and so even some of the social issues in the world is how do they view the historical timeline? I've noticed that I, well, I, I read a whole book on the, the religion of technology Um where he it's actually a Marxist scholar, but he's talking about the development of this presupposition that we're going to return back to the Garden of Eden through the development of technology, beginning with some of the quote unquote prophecies of Yakima Fiore and how this idea actually got developed in some of the scholastic monasteries where they they saw that the the qualities of mankind that were lost through the fall were going to be redeemed through technology. And this was a totally different um, eschatological perspective of the historical timeline where things were going to get better and better and better. This presupposition of, of progress, which we can see then uh, with Hegel, with Marx, with all this different stuff that, oh, well, things are going to get better. And and even uh, uh, you get Orthodox people I've met at church, Orthodox people in the world, but in Christian, generally speaking, you look at Pope Francis now condoning LGBTQ issues, uh, gay marriage, um, that there's like this presupposition, oh, well, things are getting better. Things are moving forward. Where from my perspective as a traditional Christian, we're trying to maintain these boundaries, we're, we're looking at in the opposite perspective. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse from this perspective, from this point forward. There may be uh, fluctuations. There may be points in which things get a little bit better, but ultimately things are going to get worse from this point forward. And I think this is such a key element on how people are perceiving what's going on in and around these churches. Or if they're looking at the Abrahamic house of faith, well, th this is wonderful. This is peace amongst the Abrahamic religions. This is uh, a, a, a time in which we're seeing advancement. But uh, this is actually a very nefarious and pernicious presupposition in regards to the timeline and how we view that. I was curious what your thoughts are, or if you've seen this also creep up, how people sort of reinterpret the, the historical timeline as we as Christians. And therefore, that's going to set them on a totally different trajectory in regards to social values and social norms. Yeah, the way that the subversion would, would work is to do what you're saying and then to gradually change, right? Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we've covered lately is the history of the uh, Fabian Socialist Movement, which, is a, which was a movement in the UK that um, wanted to do what they called a reform Marxism. And reform Marxism was just a way to combine the uh, failed elements of Marxism with uh, big capitalism. And that's why we find so many of the, these big capitalists uh, being such uh, ardent supporters of, uh, of socialism and Marxism is because they saw it as a way to steer and control. And a lot of people get confused over this because they see the National Council of Churches, they see the World Council of Churches, and they say, well, these are Marxist institutions. And so uh, it must be this part of this Cold War battle that, you know, that the, the, the KGB and, and Russia is behind. And it's true that the that Moscow did uh, have KGB uh, operatives and agents in the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches. They did have bishops uh, in Russia and other places, too, that were co-opted for the KGB. But the CIA did the exact same thing in the Cold War. And, the, and the, the problem is that in the long run, these institutions like the National Council of Churches and World Council of Churches were not ultimately run by Moscow. In fact, they were run by and funded and aided by the people that I'm talking about who bragged right. about how much money they put in to set up those institutions. Right. So we have to be careful to not get caught up in the old neocon sort of Cold War dialectic of thinking that the um, <clears throat> liberation theology, which is Marxist, OK, so right. let's be let's be clear. It is Marxist and it does have this notion that was really pioneered before that with by uh, Rockefeller Sr. known as uh, social gospel. So social gospel is the idea which uh, Rockefeller Sr. talks about in here. He says that 
um, I realized that what I wanted to do with Christianity was remove the, the miraculous components and turn it into something that he calls socializing or have the gospel having a socializing effect, mm, which we so, see everywhere at this. Absolutely. Point. So social gospel is first and social gospel uh, begins originally not to affect orthodoxy or the Roman, but the Protestant world. And so what the Rockefellers did was they they established uh, entire seminaries, bought off a lot of seminaries and, and, and religious institutions and universities and or said things like, well, if you allow us to appoint and decide who will be the, the chair of this department, the head of this department, we'll donate a million dollars to your university. So that's how they, they did that in the Protestant world. And this is a, this is the history of how the Protestant churches in America in the 1920s to 30s pretty much all became liberalized. So mm -hmm. if you wonder why so many, you know, Methodist or, or, or uh, Presbyterian, uh, PCUSA or, uh, you know, ELCA, Lutheran, why, why so many of those churches are so, uh, you know, Skittles today, it's actually because they were flipped really quick in the 1920s and 30s over to what I'm talking about. And in fact, right. um, uh, Presbyterian ministers of that time, for example, knew about this and even wrote about it. Uh, there's a famous uh, uh, Presbyterian theologian named J, uh, J. Gresham Machen. <clears throat> who wrote a, a book, I forget the name of it, but he wrote a book about the, the, the liberalization of the Protestant world at that time in the 30s or 40s. And so <clears throat> that's how it occurred. And then the same strategy they used in the Roman Catholic world, according to the, the Wim Hof text, and then they're doing the same thing in the Orthodox world too. So mm -hmm. it, it's the same game plan that works really well through foundations, through a private funding, through donations, right, to steer the institutions and the seminaries in this direction. So that's how it's done. It's not primarily done through some, uh, you know, secret cabal that, you know, initiates people into a, a sect and then sends them into the seminaries to, I mean, there, that might exist in some cases, but it's more of an overt uh, monetary control through donations and you know, Rachel, our friend Rachel Wilson, uh, yeah. had a good essay that she wrote on her Substack called "How uh, uh, Foundations and, and uh, NGOs are, are are Quietly Subverting the Orthodox World." Right. And we know that because they did the exact same thing in the Protestant Roman Catholic world. Is what I'm trying to explain. So, right. yeah. So, feminism is another aspect of this, where you want to to revolutionize the church's view towards men and women, the uh, you know male only priesthood that has to go. All of that has to go because it's part of this agenda. That is not random. It's not just random lives. It's a coordinated, concerted agenda to steer the church in a certain direction, amenable to these ultimately globalist interests. Right. Yeah. Maybe you could speak a little bit to where it's now infiltrating orthodoxy, because I watched the stream that you and Rachel did. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, the whole hit piece that Sarah Riccardi Schwartz did on sort of infiltrating uh, one of our orthodox monasteries here in the U.S. and then basically kind of baiting people and to saying certain things that she can totally didn't take out of context and distort and then paint uh, th this form of orthodoxy as radical and fundamentalist, which, again, I don't see as being a fundamental orthodox. I don't see that as an insult. But um, but how how these ecumenical and these uh, progressive ideology about the world is is being actively and uh, is actively infiltrating within the Orthodox church. Could you speak a little bit about what, where this is happening, why people need to keep their eyes peeled? And again, why I asked you to come on and do this stream um, because it is, it's not just the Catholic church. It's not just Protestantism. It's not just, you know, liberation theology. It is active within the Orthodox faith right now. We're already seeing the schism within uh, the Ukrainian situation. We're already seeing the patriarch of Jerusalem, the patriarch of Alexandria, um, already I, my patriarch, patriarch, John of Antioch went and spent, this was in 2021, spent a week in the Vatican comes back and our, and then has very, uh, sympathetic language regarding Pope Francis. And so we're seeing um, even among the Orthodox hierarchy that this, this spirit is already infiltrating, but because we are of a dis decentralized church that does not disprove Again, the point of the truth of the Christology and the ecumenicism—I mean, the uh, ecclesiastical theology that we're trying to maintain. So, can you talk a little bit about how this is actually infiltrating Orthodoxy right now? Yeah. So, <clears throat> like we said, the same uh, model that would be used uh, in the other churches that worked is going to be—it's—it's it's not hard to figure. It's the same model that would be that is being used in the Orthodox world. So, essentially, you have different um, grants. Uh, foundations, uh, wealthy donors that 
have an agenda and they will intentionally and publicly talk about, you know, their desire to see the Orthodox world go in a different direction, see it change, see it um, give in to, to ecumenism, to Skittles, you know, all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff to, uh, to, to the women, to female priesthood. And um, one example of this is uh, Ariana Huffington's husband um, or ex, uh, the guy that she used to be married to. Um, he publicly has uh, a, a foundation that is geared towards changing uh, the sexual ethics of the Orthodox church. Uh, he's very mm. public about it. Um, the, the, uh, Fordham university circles are very public about yep. their, uh, agenda to see the Orthodox world go in a, both an ecumenist and a, a, a liberal way. And so yep. you'll find that, you know, typically the people that are in those circles are also pushing for the same types of things, uh, that the, uh, Huffing Huffington guys pushing for, um, and we see that manifest uh, in certain first and uh, typically in the, in the academic circles. And so certain universities in, yep. for example, Canada uh, in the Orthodox world are pushing a lot of this stuff. We find it at Fordham and uh, oddly enough, it's, it's oftentimes Jesuit universities. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is not just because Jesuit universities are typically tasked with ecumenism, but it's precisely because of the geopolitical stuff that I was mentioning earlier is that during the time of Vatican II, especially the Jesuits were really important for uh, the Cold War. And so you had C.D. Jackson, Henry Luce of Time Magazine wanting to make this alliance with uh, the Jesuits and very, because they're very academic, right? And there's so many right. Jesuit institutions. You've got Georgetown, you've got Fordham, uh, you know, you've got, you've got tons of these in the U.S. And so they have a lot of sway, a lot of power. Um, and you know, it's not accidental that we see people like John Brennan coming out of uh, uh, these universities. And, you know, John Brennan sets up, Brennan, uh, you know, is, is supposedly a convert to Islam, right? Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> from a Jesuit university to Islam. And that's because right. these institutions are, are intimately tied up in terms of the uh, American intelligence apparatus, basically, is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. And we see that a lot with uniatism as well. We, we find that a lot of uniates are involved in these kinds of uh, foreign operations. And that's why the uniates played a key role uh, in the Ukraine situation, um, because right. the uniate ecumenist movements were a means by which a lot of uh, revolution and change could occur in terms of the geopolitical strategies to split the Ukraine, not just in terms of the Maidan coup in 2014, but to split the Ukraine also in terms of the theological and ideological uh, groupings of the people as well. So geopolitical strategy, uh, color revolution, all this kind of stuff, it doesn't just involve uh, political, it's twofold. It also involves ideological splits. And that's why you would find uh, a lot of Protestant uh, evangelical groups in the Ukraine also were being funded and supported uh, in this regard to, again, split what's existing in, in the Ukraine in the Orthodox world. So that was very key for the overall strategy of where the elite want to go in the future in terms of nato and pushing back russia and again that doesn't make russia uh, i'm not i've never been this champion of like oh russia is going to save the world and um right. i worship putin and all this stuff I, I i don't i don't ever say that but i'm just because i analyze these uh, situations with what i think is really going on people just assume that oh you work for russia uh, or something like that <laughs> right. it's like well you understand that uh you know rocor it's in communion with uh, uh the mp but it was only in 2008 that that Rocor was joined back in communion with the MP and the existence of Rocor was the immigrants right that left Russia under the uh, the persecution so the idea that Rocor is a bunch of KGB is just absurd and totally ridiculous given the history of people fleeing from Bolshevik and Soviet persecution right it just makes no sense. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the whole situation in Ukraine is just a great tragedy. Um, I'm always, almost always in the last 20 years, um, anti-war, not because I'm a pacifist, but because I don't think the justifications for the wars of the last 20 years and probably even older, uh, 30 right. years, right, that, that they were really justified or uh, wise decisions. I think that most wars, as General Smedley Butler said, are fought for uh, rich people. And right. it's for their gain and it's not for a national defense. Uh, that's what it's sold as. And so, you know, that that's always been my take. Um, the same with Desert Storm. 
right? Same right. with uh, Iraq, uh, Syria. Like I, I'm typically anti-war in all these cases. Right. And as a believing Christian, I want to now connect this with the spirit of Antichrist. So people that want to criticize you or say, oh, you're OK. So you're saying there's all these conspiracy theories and all these people are in on it. No, that's not what we're saying. They're saying we're saying that there are certain groups. There are elite uh, organizations. There is a lot of elite money. But as a Christian, this is all moving towards essentially the dissolution of all boundaries to a one world government. There will be no more nation states. There will be no sort of unique uh, identity amongst people. You're all going to be a sort of automatized uh, number system within a grand, you know, global government. And so this ecumenical movement is the beginning. We can already see it of the new one world religion, which we as Christians should be anticipating and, and keeping our eyes open to see the Abrahamic house of worship uh, is certainly a prime example of this. And so it's not that all these people are in on a conspiracy. It's that people who buy into some of this worldly ideology who then reject what we would consider the truth, uh, the, the, the theology of the Orthodox church scripture itself they can't help but promote something that just falls into a general pattern that's moving towards our own enslavement and this sort of antichrist system. So I was curious if you could speak towards how all this ecumenism is leading towards this one world system. We already see it. The government, um, again, who knows what is in Putin's heart? You don't have to be pro-Putin or love Putin to, to see well, I'm not polarized by the situation. I can look at uh, Russia in an honest way and say, OK, well, yeah, NATO's been encroaching. Look what they're doing. They're going back and forth. Look at all this money that all these Western governments are flooding into Ukraine really as a money laundering operation. Like what's going on here? Uh, is this a catalyst for the Great Reset? I saw Russia jump on a digital currency, the yuan related to China. We all should be expecting all this stuff. So I don't know what's in Putin's heart. I don't know what's in Krill's heart, but we can also look at this objectively and not be polarized by the propaganda of the West. And so generally speaking, then spiritually, all this stuff, this dissolution of, of truth, of these boundaries, of amalgamating everything together, this is moving towards an antichrist system um, at one point or another. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, like you said, do, do I know if this is the end of the world? No, I don't know. And I have no idea when that'll be, um, you know, the, uh, you know, we could be nearing that full on implementation of a beast system and it wouldn't surprise me if they try to roll that out in the next 10 years, or it could be, you know, a hundred years or a thousand years down the road. We don't know that. But what we do know is that, you know, from the biblical view of history, the, beast system as john says you know he says there's many antichrists so it's a recurring pattern whereby the the forces of evil always seem to want to try to instantiate the same uh type of control system right they always want to have that nimrod tower of babel types type setting recur and right. they do that because not because uh uh well, ultimately, I think it's because the motivations of, of the demonic or Satan are anti-human. And so what Satan wants to do is, number one, um, draw mankind away from the worship of God to the worship of him. But in so doing, it's because he wants to destroy humanity. And he wants to destroy humanity, according to the Eastern Fathers, because we are made in the image of Christ. Right. And so the the devils, the, the, the ones that the angels that fell, the devils felt that this place for man was undue that the angel should be given that right that was not right that man would be lifted to this kind of a, of a position so it's the envy of the devil that led him to to fall and his pride mm -hmm. and thus he has this perpetual hatred of humankind throughout world history because of the incarnation because man was going to be raised via the incarnation because uh, as we read in the church fathers in in genesis man is made in the image of christ in Genesis, right. it's the logos that's creating man. I mean, it's the Trinity, but it's, it's per right. particularly that we we reflect the image of the logos. That's why the uh, incarnation is so important, which we're seeing yep. in the in the ecumenism. They're they're not well, you know. We see Aryan Christologies reemerging amongst high profile people uh, right. within Christianity. This ha you, that's why you have to maintain these, and you can't. Uh, negotiate. Well, was he God? Was he fully man? No, he has to be. That's the only way that truth and our salvation can be maintained. Right. Yeah. And so that would, uh, 
be it that manifestation of that demonic attempt to destroy mankind because mankind's made in the image of God. And so there's always this move in that direction on the part of the demonic to try to unify in this, uh, you know, cacophony uh, of chaos to destroy ultimately the church, right? It's because it's a battle between two kingdoms. Right. And so, um, yeah, that's why they have to attack. And if you look at church history, right, the devil has tried different approaches. Like early on, it was 300 years of just straight up martyrdom, right? And then it became, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll infect the church with these heresies, right? Uh, Arianism, Nestorianism, you know, monophysitism, all these different right. things that undo, right, the balance of, uh, you know, Christ to natures and whatnot. Right. And so iconoclasm, right, which is another attack on the incarnation. And so now in, in our day, it's just it just happens to be the case that, well, I guess it's all the heresies, but the heresy of our day just happens to be this notion of ecumenism that um, it's an ecclesiological approach, which is, is a little more deceptive because, you know, it appears good on the surface. So, well, we all believe in Jesus, right? Okay, but what Jesus? I mean, the Mormon Jesus, the Aryan Jesus. I mean, right. what, well, and I what saw in the mean? World Council of Churches, they accept Mormonism as yeah. one of the variations of Christianity. Well, why wouldn't you? Like on what? Because on what basis do you say there is no basis? Right, exactly. And really, the only basis there is, uh, you know, geopolitical power motivations anyway. So, of course, why not have them on board? Um, exactly. Which they submitted to the Skittles, and now they can they condone LGBTQ, uh, all that stuff in their church. Right, and that's a oh, the whole history of that church is very bizarre and wild. <laughs> yeah, as, as that's all know, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's 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 ultimately antichrist in that it's a, an attempt to undo the incarnation and uh, the ecclesiological implications of the incarnation. So, yeah, and I thought it was really interesting. I mean, you're anti about Well, oh, John okay. says, uh, "What does John say?" Right? Any anyone that denies the that God came in the flesh is spirit of antichrist. Right. I thought it was really interesting. I was looking into the Abrahamic House of Faith and that the Catholic Church dedicated it to St. Francis of Assisi, which is noted for environmentalism, animals, and all this different stuff. So it's a way to sort of bridge into global climate change and all this different, I would argue, dehumanizing ideologies uh, that you're talking about, these, these anti-Christ systems. It's not, uh, again, when, do, when is that going to happen? We don't know. But this dissolution of boundaries or these anti-human ideologies like, I would say, global climate change and globalism and the Great Reset and uh, all this Skittle stuff, all this stuff is absolute direct attacks on humanity and us being made in the image of God. And, and so in Orthodox theology, the more you accept these lies, the more truth dissipates within yourself. You can't be filled with the energy of truth, which is an uncreated energy of God, and also believe in all the coof stuff and be terrified of, of you know, all this propaganda in the world. So I was curious, we could now just discuss a little bit of this fundamentally gets back to an epistemic problem. Is there objective truth or not? Because that's what this antichrist system is ultimately trying to undermine is the objectivity of truth itself. And we're claiming truth is Jesus Christ. And we're using then logic and reason and scripture and all this different stuff to argue that. But whether it be in philosophy, whether it be in governments, whether it be uh, just in social circumstances, society itself, there is no objective truth anymore. And that is, to me, the ultimate religion of the antichrist is that the people are going to worship the antichrist because they don't believe in objectivity itself. Yeah, I think that the first delusion that we have to believe is that there's not objective truth, right? We have to believe that truth isn't uh, objective, and by extension, if it's not objective, then it's not a person. It's not a personal logos, right? But right. those things go together because the one of the results of the fall, in my view, on a personal level, is that we're kind of born into being relativists, right? We're, we're kind of born into being these immature beings that believes or views the whole world is revolving around us. We worship ourselves and we love ourselves first and foremost due to being sons of Adam. And that's because Adam in the fall, you know, compacted himself with the devil and then put his descendants under that kind of compact that they would be born with that uh, concupiscence, or the passions with that deficiency, that tendency towards evil doesn't mean that they're inherently evil doesn't mean that their nature is evil it just means that they're born with that deprivation of grace and thus the tendency to evil and one manifestation of that 
on an individual level for all of us is that we are super uh, self-centered and selfish and children are this way, right? Right. And especially as we grow older, we get into our teenage years that manifests and and all of us in a very rebellious and selfish way. So we're all that way, but that is because we are in that sense, born into, in a very limited sense, and be careful what I'm saying here, into the devil's world, okay? Right, I don't mean literally the devil's world, right? Right. But as John says, right, that this, he calls it the, this this cosmos, right, is fallen. And he's talking about the present state of the world, right, as, quote, the devil's. But it's not ultimately the devil's. Ultimately, it's the church's world and it's Christ's world. But it's been handed over for a time, right uh to the devil to wreak havoc and to tempt everybody and to have his time before the eschaton where the devil and and the antichrist and all that are thrown into the lake of fire and there's a complete end to to that reign of uh wickedness and rebellion but uh there will always be that temptation of man to relativism and what relativism is in my view is just a just a manifestation of that uh principle that's in the garden where Adam and Eve are tempted and they say, I will determine what's true. Right. Remember right. what Satan offers. He says, yes, you know, God doesn't want you to know good and evil because he doesn't want you to have the powers that he has. And so basically the, the, uh, the offer is you determine truth and falsity. You determine good <laughs> and evil on your own. That's the temptation. And that's just relativism. Right. Relativism is a, uh, you know, re, uh, capitulation of the fall basically right and so yeah and that why, pride that's pride's the pride mother is. of all sins and so getting us into a worldview in which we would then believe in relativistic truth to some sort right makes the point in which i'm the uh, epistemic uh judge of what is true then and therefore i really then am going to worship myself which is why i think people are naturally then going to worship uh whoever emerges as the antichrist and one of the things i've talked to a handful of clergy about is you know, I, I speculate and I obviously don't know any more than anybody else, but that the Antichrist will be if Christ is fully God, fully man, the Antichrist is going to be like half man, half machine. I, I believe he's going to be a homosexual uh, rule of one world government from Jerusalem and people are going to worship him because he will be hooked up to the AI. He will be hooked up to the 5G satellites. He will be able to know what's going on in Beijing and Rio de Janeiro and L.A. all at the same point. And so you're looking at a man but he's hooked up to this entire globalist interconnected digital network, which is going to give him the sort of false accoutrements and attributes we associate with divinity. And that's why he's going to be worshiped as this sort of a false inverted God incarnate. And I think we're already seeing that with the metaverse and everything else that's laying out right now. Yeah. The metaverse, as you pointed out, is like the ultimate mimic of reality, right? Right. So like you have truth, you have, uh, um, the real world, you have objectivity. And then the met- metaverse, in my view, which again, co- coincides with your analysis is like, it's an attempt to offer to mankind, um, the, a version of his imagination that he could live in. And then he can, in a way, pretend to be his own God in that imaginary world. Right. And I, I can't think of any more seductive kind of, you know, uh, deceptive offer to mankind as something like that it has to be satanic in origins right and again even even as you know that you know there's nothing wrong with tech itself but the right. offer right but the tech is only as good as the user of the tech and so yeah, if the we, will that's put into the exactly. tech well and, and also if we've been trained in virtue right so one of the reasons for example that we couldn't uh be given the tree of knowledge of good and evil yet is that we weren't uh trained in virtue yet Mm. And so, uh, you know, some of the Eastern fathers talk about the fact that, um, you know, God created both of the trees. And so if he created them, they can't be inherently evil. So the tree of knowledge isn't an evil tree, but it's a tree that man wasn't ready to eat yet until he had been confirmed in virtue. Because if you have a lot of knowledge, but you're not confirmed in virtue, the knowledge can be used for evil or destructive. Right. And so uh, man had to be perfected in the virtue of obedience and love of God first. And then he could have of that tree and it wouldn't be a temptation for him. And so in the same way, a lot of this tech knowledge, I wrote an essay many years ago that's in, I think, my first book uh, about how, you know, knowledge without wisdom is just destructive. Like it's, right. it's like giving, you know, would you give a handgun to a baby? No. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it doesn't make any sense. So in the same way, um, you know, we have to be 
trained in virtue before the, these amazing kinds of technologies wouldn't be to our own demise. And the unfortunate thing I think is that a lot of this technology is intentionally being constructed and used to undermine humanity. It's not being used to lift up humanity. It could be, I mean, theoretically it could be it, right. Uh, but, it, but it's probably not going to be used in that way. No, it doesn't seem like it is at all. And you know, you've been ringing the alarm well before 2020 about the digital currencies, about, uh, you know, aspects of the Great Reset, uh, you know, the lockdowns, uh, the fake alien invasion, you know, something I just saw you share, which again is this presupposition that we need to form a one world response, a one world government that we're going to have, you know, well, the, the, <laughs> I literally did, they referred to like a mothership. Uh, this had to do with, for those who don't know, Jay recently shared it, so go check out his uh, social media, but it's an NBC, uh, sort of headline that they did on their on their world news with a Harvard professor talking about how, well, some of these balloons and, and some of these UFO sightings, this might have to do with, you know, what we're in contact with aspects or, or, or messengers from the mothership. And it's like, what? Are, what are you talking about? But if you're in this relativistic goop, you know, gook that people believe in well then you're gonna just like the coof you're gonna believe your authorities you're gonna believe you know the, the guy on tv who told you the mothership's just outside the stratosphere yeah one thing that relativism does and i think why the power elite uh really like it as an ideology is that it weakens the people and makes them very pliable and so you're basically putty for social engineers for people in silicon valley for people in the ad agencies to be you're essentially exploited or used at will and uh, you can be steered however they want and and humans will always kind of be deferring to some authority right so if it's not god if it's not truth you may think that oh i just follow myself and my own desires man you know i'm my own god or whatever like you may <laughs> right. think that but you're actually going to be propagandized very uh, easily because you don't have any any uh, root, you don't have any way to judge truth and falsehood because you've su you surrender the notion of truth and falsehood by being a relativist. So you're basically just putty for the system to right. be programmed with the next thing that comes along. And you know that when we talk about the like the NPC meme, the reason that the NPC meme works is because of what we're talking about, right? Because it resonates. We, we can realize and recognize that these are people that don't have any critical thinking skills or ability to uh, you know separate truth from fact from falsehood, fact from fiction because they're completely uh, uh, propagandized because they do not love the truth. And so they're sent strong delusion, for example, as uh, Seth, Seth Thessalonians talks about, right? Right. So yeah, so you're basically just silly putty and you will accept the next download that the system wants to give you. And so, you know, people are going to believe, they'll believe anything and everything, right? And so like, you know, every, every uh, activism thing that you're supposed to go along with, whether it was, you know, put up the black screen to signify that you're BLM, <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? And if you don't do it, then you're racist. You're right? racist. Yeah. And so there, there, there have been a series of these, right? Then you're supposed to put up the uh, Skittles flag and then you're supposed yep. to put up the, uh, you know, the Ukrainian flag or whatever. Yep. And the, the crazy thing about that is that the people that just follow along and sync with that without any critical thinking. And the reason that they're able to do that is what we're talking about is that they've, they've given up the notion of there being truth and a lot of these people believe that everything is will to power. Right. And so they're actually justified in lying because all everything is lies. Yep. And so the only way to get ahead or to do anything is just to, by all means and in any and every means, to destroy people via the lies. Right. And that came right out of the academy. You know, you look at Foucault, his whole thing's about yeah. knowledge power. The only thing that really exists is power. Knowledge is relative to the power that exists. Right. And and so again we see the same thing the the academics put out the the you know the the structure the the ideas and then it gets pushed down onto society itself and these people that's all they believe in is power but the people who bought into the mass who bought into the jab who bought into the skittle stuff who bought into it's funny how like you said this whole antichrist system is anti-human and what do they do? The people who believe it are actively killing themselves. We're watching them kill themselves in real time. People that I, I know personally who believed in the, the jab narrative, now they're aware of it. They woke up, but it was after they had a minor heart attack. It was after something you know tragic happened to them. I right. know another person that one of their close relatives died 
very, very quickly after getting the jab. It's like, well, you believe in lies. Sin is death. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're believing in something that's going to kill you and you act accordingly. Yeah, I think that the <clears throat> you can't get out of that without grace, right? Like, and sometimes right. grace requires, uh, like you said, really traumatic situations to occur. You know, I mean, there have been people that have been, you know, you know, fairly prominent converts in the last few years who had they converted because they had a relative die, and they talked about that, right? They were like, I, I never would have really woken up until my sister died or whoever, right? So. I think that the the collapse in people's uh, trust in various aspects of the system always does help to contribute to the possibility of them coming out of that matrix, so to speak, to use that cheesy analogy. But right. I know, I mean, I know in my case, you know, I had to have some pretty big spankings, uh, you know, in my life, you know, seven, eight years ago that helped me really get on board with coming into the church because, you know, I was really interested in orthodoxy for many years, but, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was being super wild, partying, sleeping with, you know, dozens of girls, having a lot of fun, just doing whatever I wanted uh, because I got really burned out on on theology. I treated it in a very kind of intellectual way. Right. Um, and then, you know, I had to get pneumonia a couple of times, get really sick, get really, you know, um, serious about like, hey, life is short, uh, you know. And But what I'm saying is that it, it kind of took those situations of getting really sick <laughs> to wake up to be like, Hey man, my life's pretty short. Maybe I should, you know, get right with God and, uh, you know, get on the path of, of grace and repentance, theosis, uh, rather than putting this off. And I think that's what, you know, the devil gets us to kind of like always kind of put it off, eh, you know, I'll wait down the road and, you know, maybe, maybe a little while, maybe a couple weeks I'll check out a Orthodox church. I remember there was a one point two where I was like, I was really trying to find a decent Orthodox church and I couldn't find one. And I remember coming up to a, a, a four way lane and it was a specific church I was trying to find many, many years ago that ended up being like the catalyst for me finally coming into the church. And I remember just coming to that four way and I was like, you know what? I, it was weird. Cause I felt like I was at a four lane, a four way in my life too. It's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't, it was just a, a random morning. I was really frustrated. I was like, man, you know what? I'm kind of tired of seeking Orthodox churches and trying to find a good one. And I was like, I'm just done. I'm going to quit. I, I don't care anymore. And then I was like, you know what? I'm not going to quit. So it was like, there was like this weird point where it's like, I'm going to give it one last spot, one last check. I'm going to go a block down there. And if I don't see this church, I can't, I was like driving around for like 30 minutes, couldn't find it. And I finally found it. And that ended up being my spiritual father. It ended up being, you know, one of the best things that happened to me. Mm. And I was this close to not driving the extra block to find the church. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, that was God's providence. That was God's grace. Just kind of saying like, look, don't give up. At least try, you know, this last, it was the last parish that I, uh, that I found in that area that, that I thought would even be, you know, drivable. Right. And that ended up being the one that was really perfect for me, right. To find a spiritual father. Cause I've been praying like, God, you know, if you do want me to come to the Orthodox church, please help me to find a spiritual father. It's, you know, really hard. I felt certain clergy trying to, push me out of the church you know what do i need to do here and it was that close where i just almost did it and then did and then you know it ended up being great so i don't know i don't know why i told that story i was just trying to remember well, like, it uh, actually connects perfect with where i wanted to kind of close our conversation before we got into super chats and that is the influx of people coming into the Orthodox faith due to, you know, the work that you do was it, as I said before, is greatly influential on me when I started my journey after sort of learning the theology of the church and then watching some of your streams sort of unpack the nuances of it. That was greatly influential. I was, I'm ahead. So I had to like rationally wrap my head around things before I would actually step inside of a church. And um, now with what we're seeing, I, everybody I talk to, all the priests I talk to that come on in, in chat, they're all seeing massive influx of, of young men and women, but mostly young men coming into the Orthodox Church and taking things seriously. And in 2020, uh, be it Providence, but the sort of semiotics of 2020 and perfect vision, it's like every all the conspiracy theories that people have talked about. You look back, you know, all the, all the history before 2020, and now it all falls into place. It makes a hell of a lot more sense. And now if you have those eyes every year, every month, every day, you're seeing the agenda unfold more and more and more. And so, um, 
you talked about the providence and, and just pushing forward. And sometimes tragedy, God brings that providentially into your life to wake you up, to get you to take things more seriously, to look at things in a different way. And I feel like right now we're seeing this more than ever, at least in a more American orthodoxy. I can't speak to you know other people in different countries, but within American orthodoxy, so many young people are coming to the church. And this is what then... Uh, ecumenism, why we have to defend against it. And ironically, often it's these young men who convert that know the theology a lot more that are looking for something really rigid in defense to the degeneracy of the world. All this stuff's coming, and wherever do you take refuge? You're going to do it at the Methodist church? You're going to do it in the Catholic church now? You're going right. to do it in the Anglican church that wants to change the pronouns of God? Where are you going to go? And it seems like everybody who's then really active and seeking that, well, orthodoxy is the last option. And then you find a base parish, a, a nice priest, and you're like, oh, finally, it's somewhere I can like relax. Yeah. And that's why uh, ecumenism, why we can't blur these distinctions and why we have to defend the theology and the faith, because this the, that's the only reason why everybody's coming to the church right yeah. now. And exactly. then there's active forces within the church to try to dispel apologists like yourself who are right. bringing so many young people to the faith because we're not compromising the faith. Right. Well, I even had an OCA cleric say at one point, uh, this is five or six years ago, um, quote, I don't want all of these young guys coming to my parish. What? So, yeah. Why would they uh, say I that? I won't say who, but that was a prominent yeah. OCA priest five or six years ago that said that. And, you know, that's the unfortunate thing is like, well, who do you think the future of the church is? I mean, well, maybe if you submit to women priesthood, then it won't be young guys and you could just have a bunch of women priests. But like who, who like who is going to be in the seminaries? And I'm proud to say, you know, by God's grace, like, you know, we we have from our audience several people that have gone to seminary. Right. right uh, who are at Jordanville now, uh, you know, who are longtime uh, watchers, listeners and, and friends of ours. So, uh, you know, shout out to Luke Kindrat and, and other, is, yeah. you know, base guys like that. So that's the future of the church. It's not going right. to be people who uh, want to go back to Rome, people who want to have a new ecumenist uh, pseudo church of all the churches. I, that, that's not the future. It's not going to be the people at, uh, you know, these different liberal outlets who want to change. Look at all the other churches that did change. Like you said, who wants to be in a, a, a rainbow Methodist church? <laughs> Rainbow piece of USA. Does anybody want to be in those churches? No. In fact, you can chart Pew, Pew Research has studies showing those churches are dying. Right. Uh, there was an article a few years ago. Well, actually, two two articles that came out in the past few years. One about the Lutherans that uh, the, the mainline Lutherans are projected to die out in, I think, 20 years. And the Cumberland Presbyterians are projected to die out even sooner than that. So basically, you have entire denominations that are that are just from the practical numbers. They're going to be gone. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the seeds of, of heresy, uh, you know, it shows that that's the fruits of heresy. Right. I mean, it's right. sterility. And right. What does Paul say about the church of that's above her? She's born. Right. She has born tenfold. Right. For the church that is uh, of, of flesh. He's talking about the flesh Israel mm -hmm. of his day. He says she's barren. He's using it as an analogy for the fact that we're making converts paul saying in his day we're getting the the numbers they are the ones that are uh sterile and are dying and so you know sterility and dying out is exactly the fruits of all of this the heresy and the schism it, the irony is that when you water down your message it doesn't actually bring you the big numbers and even if it did bring you the big numbers like a mega church did you know the turnover of mega church is like two weeks like oh, really? i didn't know that literally. there's studies on this makes that sense the majority though. of people that join mega churches they they're gone within a few weeks that makes sense so to me it's just about like numbers and you know grift or something with mega right. churches. and this but, is why it's something i tell all the all the people then again getting back and, and concluding our conversation on ecumenism is why it's important for people to learn the theology not that you have to so again as you said earlier you don't have to become orthodox and do all this stuff that we're talking about absolutely not you don't need to learn philosophy you don't need to learn all the theology you don't have to read the church fathers um you just come to the church get your spiritual father and then you know submit to its authority however for so many of the young men who are more rationally minded and looking to put the dots to together this is incredibly important because the Orthodox Church, we're already seeing it, is going to fracture. But the true church, the true faith, those who uphold the truth, 
uh, that won't ever perish and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And that's why then it's important for us to know what the true faith is so that we can always hedge our bets and keep our family and our friends and our loved ones in the true church. And that's where the work that you do, uh, Father Deacon, Dr. Ananias, Patristic Faith, uh, that's why it's so important and why it's having such a important impact on people in their real life experiences, because uh, without knowing the faith, without knowing what is objectively true regarding our theology, it's all going to fall apart. And so it, it's a it's a, it's on in the impetus of all of us to make sure that we learn the faith who the who that who want to. Again, some of the women, some of the men don't have to, but those who want to learn the faith so that you can protect it. Because if we don't protect it, who's going to? That's the whole thing is there's actually a call of, of duty here for people who are willing to do it that learn the faith and protect it and don't compromise on it because compromise are going to come more and more and more and more from this point forward. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> again, it doesn't do us any good to compromise and uh, not trying to be rude, but so Jamie's going to have to come in here uh, in about 20 minutes and do the uh, uh, podcast that she has to do. So yeah, no problem. Uh, if we can need to go ahead and go to the super chat. I'm not trying to rush you. It's just no, she's no, going to have fine. to be in here for an uh, interview she has. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's get into some of the super chats. So over on Rockfin, we got a couple super chats that came in. Uh, one from Corbin Tolan said, "Mega stream." Thank you so much, Corbin. And the next one from Paul Emil threw in five dollars says, "Arrived late." Great combo, though. So thank you so much, Paul. And then we got some over on YouTube. Uh, Megan Elford threw in $9.99. No comment. Thank you so much, Megan. We also had some new YouTube members. Shout out to Maximus Pike. Shout out to Slowboy Whiteboard. And shout out, shout out to Megan uh, American Frog 32. I'm sorry. Uh, one super chat said uh, JP2's mass appeal plus CC seems very antichristy. You, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I think that's one of the most uh, obvious kind of ecumenist, egregious type activities where, you know, he's basically um, praying with a lot of the world religions and, you know, basically uh, giving the giving the impression that all the religions are basically the same. And and yeah, the you know, when you mentioned this trad Catholic, so I said, well, there were some Orthodox clerics there, too. And yeah, absolutely. I think it was just as bad on the part of the Orthodox clerics, too. So I'm not excusing those clerics for uh, participating in the same kind of activity. And, you know, there was an Assisi too. And then, you know, Francis's encyclicals and the Pachamama and all that has just furthered this and, and taken this revelation, uh, this revolution even further, as well as the, you know, Islamic faith center. So I would say, I don't know if the Vatican or the uh, Pope is the antichrist, but it is very antichrist in spirit. Absolutely. Right. Next one comes from Jacob Simmons. Those in 499 said, I just wanted to say thanks to Jay and DPH. Y'all really helped me get from prot slash reformed world to holy orthodoxy. Became a, cumin, a catechumen this week. Well, glory to God, Jacob. Um, humbled if I've helped, and I'm sure Jay feels the same way. If we've helped in any way, uh, glory yeah, to God, man. That's awesome. Uh, next one comes from Derek Cutchie. Throws in 999 and says, always a treat to see my two favorite channels do a collab Blessed Lent to you, bro. Well, blessed Lent to you, Derek. Thank you very much. Thanks, dude. Brother. Appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, some of the Streamlabs that came in, uh, they have some more questions. So first one comes from uh, Meta Meta Ninja, and he throws in $10 and says, I recently came to the realization that I would be a pagan slash neo-shaman, Gnostic slash some LA variation if it wasn't for you both. <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Meta Ninjas. I appreciate that, bro. Um, next one comes from Aaron, and he says, what is the average velocity of an unladen swallow? I don't even know what the hell that means. All right. Well, Aaron, anyways, don't know what the hell you're talking about, but thank you for <laughs> the super chat. Uh, next one comes from Ostimos Prime, throws in five dollars, says, Love y'all boys' work. Could y'all give me thoughts on the recent revivals at Protestant churches and the concept of Protestant revivals in general? Oh, that's an interesting one, yeah. Just real quick, I looked into that, and um, uh, I, I think that it's odd that at that whatever that university was, they have a history of revivals breaking out which to me is a little suspicious um, that this, this is like the fifth or sixth time a spontaneous revival has broken out at this university. Mm. Um, I've been to Protestant 
revivals many times. I don't think they really are producing godliness or anything like that. There may definitely be sincere people who go to that and who are looking for the truth. Sure. So I don't want to knock people that are sincerely seeking, but um, I would not give any kind of like approval to, Oh, those are, you know, those are movements of the Holy spirit because, you know, it's just as Orthodox, that's not something that we can say. Um, there, again, the spirit may be individually moving people and right. put, putting them on the right path. But, um, you know, the spirit's always going to accompany correct doctrine uh, in terms of Orthodox faith. So I wouldn't give, I, I would stay away from those kinds of things. And in my experience, yeah. they're usually uh, focused on a lot of emotionalism and people are mistaking their emotions with the Holy Spirit. Right. Yep. I totally agree. And I would also follow what you said. And FDA recently talked about this one. And that, you know, the Holy Spirit may be very active and it may be very sincere faith for some individuals. But as a collective, um, you know, we should be very skeptical. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Like we said, we don't know where the Spirit is not. So we're not claiming what the Holy Spirit can and can't do. But as a general movement, uh, we should be very skeptical of what's going on. OK, next super chat comes from a uh, Christian perspective, and he says, would you guys agree that when Christ divided the loaves um, and fish, that this was a physical representation of the balance of one and many? I notice in Christ and sharing in the spirit, nothing is ever negated or subtracted, only increased by his being. Um, I would hesitate. I mean, that seems pretty speculative to me. Uh, to say that the dividing of the loaves was one a one in many balance per se. But I think that, you know, you can find, for example, in I think St. Ignatius, when he talks about the many uh, grains of bread coming together in one loaf, he says that symbolizes us in the church as a one in many unity. Um, so maybe in that sense, but I would hesitate to say that the meaning of the, the loaves being divided as one in many or something like that per se. Yeah, I, I, I also I would second that. Uh, Rigovich threw in four pounds and says, God bless you both. Well, thank you so much, Rigovich. And then a very generous super chat from my friend Nathaniel Hill throws in $100 and says, Theosis.tv, a project he's been working on. So make sure you guys go check that out. Nathaniel, God bless you and your family. He, they are all converts to orthodoxy. Uh, so wish you guys nothing but the best. Thank you so much, brother, for the very generous super chat. Um, Next one comes from Brooke M and says, any knowledge of the Greek Orthodox new metropolitan Saba? I believe that's actually my jurisdiction, the Antiochian church. Um, I don't know anything about him, but, uh, you know, un unfortunately, our former metropolitan, there was a bit of a scandal. Uh, don't need to get into it. You would know more details than I would, but um, unfortunately, there was a a scandal that broke out in the Antiochian jurisdiction and the Metropolitan had to resign. And so from my understanding, uh, Metropolitan Saba is the new Metropolitan. Do you know anything about him? I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, so sorry, Brooke. Uh, we have no knowledge of Metropolitan Saba, but uh, God willing, he is a good Metropolitan and will defend the faith. We'll find out. Uh, next one comes from uh, <laughs> a very busy doctor, Dr. Vagisil. And he says, this heresy stems from a lack of masculine discernment and a fear of, de of declaring what is right because of a fear of man over God, i.e. when I was using the word like so many times last stream and have to go to confession for sounding like a valley girl. Um, <laughs> I do, I do want to say one thing about uh, ecumenism is that there is a really strange homoeroticism that's related to it. So he's talking about it has to do with a sort of demasculinization. And I don't know how far to take that, but there's definitely something there. I use the metaphor that men are like the castle walls. Women and children are the jewels. And as men become weak, the castle walls become weak and the thieves can go and take those jewels. And so um, just within my experience, even within orthodoxy, the people that I've seen be the most ecumenic, you know, promoting ecumenism, I'll say, closet gays sometimes outright open with transgender or uh, homosexual activity I, I don't know there's something strange going on there i think the antichrist is going to be homosexual so it makes sense that for people that promoting this ideology would fall victim to that that sin but well, what are your kind of thoughts on that 
Uh, I, I did talk to a, a priest um, in Texas who had some interesting insights on this recently. And he, his advice was that uh, in his experience, a lot of times heresies are the result of uh, problems that people have in terms of sexual issues. And mm. I'm not trying to be self-righteous. I mean, I, I lust about, you know, women and I have lust. I do too. Yeah. I'm guilty. Of have the same problems that probably most guys do. So I'm not trying to be self-righteous, but he was just making the point that, that, uh, in his experience, the theological deviations usually result from people wanting to justify their uh, lifestyle, their activities or something like that was his point. Yeah. And that to me, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, it's something that we're even seeing kind of creep up into orthodoxy. So something to keep our eyes on um, your uh, doppelganger day. Jire uh, throws in seven ninety nine. Can you count on one hand all the English speaking churches in Melbourne, uh, all pro stabbies? I believe that. Absolutely. Um, seems like seems like the whole Anglosphere is pretty cut. Yeah. Um, next super chat comes from Adam nice throws in $10 and says, I'm new to orthodoxy and have been attending a Greek Orthodox church for six months. My priest gave me the Orthodox way by Kalistos where in it, he backs his points twice with the Babylonian Talmud. Why use the Talmud? Hope this is, uh, on topic. Um, um, what was the book? Um, where's what book? It was the Orthodox Way by. Oh yeah, I've read that book. Um, yeah, there's it's some very problematic book. statements. I've read, a lot of people have read that on an entry. Yeah, there's a few it. problematic statements in that book. Uh, he has an historian statement in there as well. There's kind of a, a problematic statement. So, um, yeah, I've never been a huge fan of that book. I've never recommended or given it to people. Yeah. It's it's you know it's pretty widely used and known, but uh, I, I would. I mean, sometimes people will cite Talmudic stuff because it's a kind of an uh, ancient historical attestation to this or that fact. Um, for example, there's references to the historicity of Christ in ancient Talmudic texts. So I think that just citing it per se wouldn't be wrong. Obviously, there's stuff in there that we don't believe. Yeah. So I don't, and I don't remember off the top of my head. I, I read Orthodox Way probably in 2007, so I don't remember right. all the texts that are that, that he cites in there, but. Yeah, I mean, he, unfortunately, uh, Bishop Ware uh, did have some some tendencies towards liberal statements at times. Yeah, unfortunately, it was towards the, uh, you know, God rest his soul, uh, you know, God, you know, memory eternal to Bishop Ware. But he did promote, uh, sound like he became very lenient on the LGBTQ stuff towards the end of his yeah. his life. So, uh, so definitely something to watch out for and, and for us to be cautious of. But um you know, God, God bless him and, and, and everybody related to his family. And, and again, memory eternal to him, but always gotta, always gotta be careful. Uh, so good question, Adam. Nice. Thank you. Next one comes from Justin and says great streams from both of you lately. Well, thank you so much, Justin. Appreciate thank that you. brother. Um, and meta meta Funko throws in $10 and says, good point earlier in the stream. How do I listen to Jay and David religiously and still be Protestant? Well, <laughs> you may not have a fully connected neofrontal cortex, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Meta Meta Funko. I appreciate that. And I think that, Oh, we got uh, Henry Gallard throws in $5 and says loving orthodoxy, read 10 books in one month and visited a church for the first time. But why are many Orthodox YouTubers a bit dot, dot, dot effeminate? Oh, um, well, I don't I mean, know what to mean. Who are you talking about? <laughs> Honey, please. Well, it's definitely not I you. I know everybody wants to call you the, the big mean guy because your debates and stuff, which, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I have seen a handful. I don't know if many uh, or most Orthodox YouTubers are effeminate. I mean, yeah. I, 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 don't, well, I don't know I about that, but there certainly lot. are a couple. Right. Um, you know, there's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a few that I'm aware of that I'm very skeptical of their um, sexual orientation myself. But, yeah, I would agree. Not there's not a lot that are that are that way. But. Yeah, I would say in, for Orthodox YouTube, it's way more masculine than Catholic YouTube or Protestant YouTube. Um, I would say you'd find a lot more effeminate men in, in those spheres. But uh, Henry, uh, glad you're reading books and visit a church, brother. Thank you very much. 
And um, and that looks like that does it uh, for the Super Chat. So, Jay, I want to thank you, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for all your work, brother. Uh, you. I know you get attacked, but I really do. Oh, we got one more that came in one second here. Um, really do appreciate every everything you do, man, and all the did arrows did. you thank take. You. Yeah, so God bless you. Jillian Sonny throws in R-O-N. I don't even know where that is, 50 R-O-N. But thank you, brother, for the for the super chat. But God bless you and Jamie, man. Keep up the great work. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to see what you come up with next, man. All right, Appreciate thank you. Have a good night. All right, um, bye. All right, that is going to conclude the stream, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Smash that like for everybody who's here. I also, again, want to wish everybody um, a very – uh, special thank you who became members and special shout out to slow boy whiteboard, a special shout out to American frog 32 and a very special shout out to Maximus Pike for becoming uh, YouTube uh, members. Um, so thank you guys so very much for that. Um, and uh, make sure, like I said, you smash that like a very special shout out to all the super chatters that includes Julian Sonny, uh, special shout out to Hunter Matt 007. Um, oh, and he threw in a super chat that just came in. It said, new to orthodoxy, um, having trouble finding a church in Kentucky area. I'm very wary of OCA churches due to heretical and ecumenist fathers. Any recommendations for truly orthodox churches in Indiana considering relocating soon? Uh, God bless for your work. Well, Hunter Matt, I'm in Indiana, so you're definitely welcome to come up north. Uh, we do have some good churches here in the state. Uh, unfortunately, they're all sort of around the Indianapolis area. So you'd be more if you want to reach out to me privately. I'll tell you how to, you how you could come to the church I attend, uh, me and my godfather, Subdeacon Mark. Um, I've heard uh, I, I am not an expert on any of the Orthodox churches in the Kentucky area. I have heard that there's a very beautiful church in Louisville that I planned on attending at some point, but I have not yet. So. Um, I'm not sure, brother. And, and even based on the jurisdictions, you know, and Jay would back me up here, um, just because the OCA jurisdiction or the Greek jurisdiction is a little bit more liberal, you could say, it's a parish by parish basis. So make sure you go to the parish and talk to the priest. I know, and we have some of some of our best uh, members in our community and apologists, they are in GoArch, they're in OCA, but their priests are phenomenal. And so you got to go speak to the priest let them know who you are, let them know your story. And uh, that's definitely going to help uh, find which parish and spiritual father is right for you, is right for you. So thank you so much, uh, Hunter Matt Double 007. So again, special thanks you to all the super chatters. Thank you to Jillian Sunny. Thank you to Hunter Matt 007. Thank you to Day Jire. Special thank you to Nathaniel Hill. God bless you, brother. Wish you nothing but the best in the family. Special shout out to Henry uh, Galliard. Um, he said, loving orthodoxy. Read 10 books again one month and visited a church uh, for the first time. Uh, but why are many YouTubers effeminate? I don't know how many orthodox YouTubers are effeminate. I'm really sure you're not talking about me. Um, also I do have a debate coming up with kale. So we will be diving into a, uh, I'll be debating Gnosticism with a Gnostic, uh, here in the very near future with kale. So that should be, uh, quite interesting. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we got a few more super chats that just came in here. Let's check these out. Uh, Rigovich throws in one. Um, he says, can you try and get Klaus Kenneth on, please? Ex-Tibetan monk, now Orthodox, wrote a fascinating book about demons and the magic the monks practice. Yeah, I'd be open to that. Um, wow. He, so he was in Tibetan Tibetan monk. Uh, that'd be really interesting. Let me Let me write that down. I've never heard of Klaus Kenneth. Klaus. Kenneth, but I would definitely be interested in having a conversation with him. That sounds phenomenal, bro. Um, all right, Klaus Kenneth. Thank you very much, Rigovich, for that five for five pounds. I will write that down and I will figure out uh, who Klaus Kenneth is and try to reach out to him. Thank you so much for that, man. Um, and let's see here. So thank you so much, Rigovich. Also, uh, lukewarm free zone throws in five dollars and says, Everyone read Orthodoxy in the Religion of the Future by Father Sarah from Rome. I got that right over here, actually. Uh, 
That would be this book right here. I do recommend it. Um, shout out to A Devotional Heart, my friend Allison. We recently talked about this is a great book to give people. If you're trying to, if you have a friend or a relative, you're trying to introduce orthodoxy to it, you're not sure how to go about doing it. This is a great way. So you could use orthodoxy in the religion of the future. This is a great uh, book that hits on actually many of the topics that Jay and I just talked about, some of the Eastern mysticism, uh, UFOs, all this types of stuff. So uh, lukewarm at free, or at lukewarm free zone throws in five bucks. Great point, brother. Thank you so much. God bless you. He said, God bless you, David and Jay. Well, God bless you. Uh, lukewarm free zone. Truly appreciate the support, brother. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so let me put that down. Also, I think we had another super chat. Uh, let me see here. No. Uh, special shout out. Continue to Well Emmanuel. Uh, throws in $5. Uh, shout out to Well Emmanuel. He says, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Well Emmanuel, for all your support. And thank you for being a member, Well Emmanuel. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much. Shout out to Derek Cutchy. Shout out to uh, Maximus Pike again for being a member. Shout out to Jacob Sims Simmons. Shout out to Meta Funko. Uh, shout out to Sean Malkowski. Um, shout out to Justin. Shout out to Megan Elford. Shout out to Adam Nice. Shout out to, again, Slowboyd Whiteboard. God bless you, Kristen, for becoming a member. Shout out to our beloved Dr. Vagisil. Shout out to American Frog 2 for becoming a member. Shout out to Brooke M. Shout out to Christian Perspective. Um, shout out to Ostimos Prime and Aaron and Meta Ninja. And that looks like that's going to conclude tonight's stream, guys. God bless everyone. Uh, please smash that like. Also, don't forget uh, that, again, Montanica is coming up. And so June 7th through the 11th, I'll be speaking at Montanica in Butte, Montana. I'll be there with Father Turbo, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias, Father Russell, and also a handful of other people. You can go over to patristicfaith.com and buy your tickets there. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. I'm the only clergy uh, that will non-clergy that will be there. So uh, looking forward to meeting everybody and seeing you all then. Let me just double check, make sure I got all the super chats. Looks like I did. So guys, thank you all so much. Again, smash that like, and I will be back uh, either Sunday or Monday. I'm looking to do a deep dive into Rosicrucianism. So if you guys are interested in learning a little bit about the uh, Rosicrucian Enlightenment, the secret society known as Rosicrucianism, Christian Rosenkreutz, um, I will be doing a deep dive into that. And shout out to Meta Ninja for sponsoring that stream. If you guys would like to sponsor a stream, uh, please do so. I am loving all the sponsored streams you guys have been uh, uh, supporting me with. If you would like to do that, you can sign up with this link right here and sponsor a stream. You just, um, um, here we go. Uh, here we go. You just uh, sign up and then I will contact you and we can uh, figure out which topic you are most interested in me uh, discussing. Also, if anybody would like to sign up for a one on one session, we have some slots available for next Wednesday. You can do so with that link there. And the best way you can support my work is to become a website member. You can become a YouTube member here on the YouTube or you can go to my website and get access to exclusive video content. You can become a premium uh, member for $25, get access to all the fitness membership stuff, the exclusive video content, plus two private Zoom meetings with all the fellow um, uh, fellow uh, premium members. So God bless everyone. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend and blessed Lent to all of you. And I will see you guys either Sunday or Monday. So until then, as always, God bless. <laughs>